Yep. Hello. Uh, welcome to all of you, those in here in Barcelona at the Design Hub here in Barcelona, and those that are uh, through the Arts Electronica website. So uh, we are glad to have this uh, talk here, both online and on site here in Barcelona. And uh, uh, after so many months hidden in our houses after this global pandemic that is struggling throughout the, the world. No? So, and this is one of the reasons why the Electronica right now is this uh, special edition distributed throughout the world. No? So we are happy to be this network of Arts Electronica Garden. And uh, I am Paul Sina. I am uh, director of the Art and Technology Program uh, of the Open University of Catalonia, Universidad Tuberta de Catalonia. And uh, I'm part of this curatorial team uh, of this um, garden. And we are, I'm also preparing the IC edition that will be in Barcelona during the next years. So um, in this session, we will talk, uh, we will talk about um, this uh, art and science of the political ecology of disasters. No? This is in clear relationship with this global situation and that we all experience in all the cities involved in also in this Ars Electronica garden. No? So catastrophes and vulnerability has once again brought us uh, to the forefront of the, uh, the urgency of assuming and acting against the consequences of an Anthropocene that advances inexorably. So we will explore this, um, all those possible futures ahead of us in this session. No? So that's why uh, we have invited these different uh, participants that we are also glad to, that you are able to come here and to be on site and also uh, through this online uh, website. No? So the participants of this session, session will be Joanna Moll, uh, uh, Ingrid Guardiola, Andy Gracie, and Israel Rodriguez. No? And also Vanina Hoffman, that uh, she, she's going to be the relator, that is going to do like a written report that we're going to publish after the session is, session is done. No? So I'll just go ahead and then I will present Joanna Moy. Uh, Joanna Moy is, um, is, is a Barcelona and Berlin based artist and researcher. Her work uh, critically explores the way post capitalist um, narratives affect the alphabetization of machines, humans, and ecosystems. Her main research topics include internet, materiality, uh, surveillance, social profiling, and interfaces. Uh, furthermore, she is the co-founder of the Critical Interface Poetic Research Group at Angar, uh, Barcelona, uh, which is one of the also main organizers of this garden, and co-founder of the Institute of Advancement of Popular Automatisms. No? And she is currently visiting lecturer at the Universitat uh, Potsdam and the Escola Superior d'Art de Vic uh, here in Barcelona. No? So, Joana, uh, could you tell us uh, in which way internet and ecology interact uh, between each other. Uh, your artwork has been dealing with, uh, with all these issues in some way. And uh, if, I, if I'm right, no? So uh, could you explain us a bit about them, about how you interrelate these, uh, these two words, these two keywords? I can, I can. Please. Yes. Presentation. All right. So I think when we talk about um, the ecology of disaster and all this, I think I came across this paradox very recently, I mean, uh, maybe one or two years ago, and I was quite in shock of how much we don't acknowledge this, and this is a massive paradox. It basically um, talks about the use of energy that, uh, and about the paradox of efficiency, like the more efficient something is, the more demand there is on the other side, and then efficiency doesn't work. Right? And this was coined uh, already in the first industrial revolution, and it's some sort of paradox that has been ignored since then. Yeah? It basically talks about that there is no technological process, uh, progress that is not going to use extra and more extra and extra resources. And I think this is something very important to have in mind, because I think it's, it explains quite a lot of things. So again, I mean, most of the people that know me, I'm always talking about the same things, right? But uh, also there is a huge paradox when we talk about the internet. The internet is not a cloud. Yeah? Uh, we've been told that the internet is something that's ethereal, that it's up in the sky, that doesn't have any weight, it doesn't pollute, that it's actually nothing, it's quite divine even, right? And it's, the reality is really far from this idea, whereas the internet is underground, it's very dirty, and it consumes a lot of energy, and it's really, really messy. Yeah, those are some cables that are landing from the Atlantic Oceans to the center in New York. And you can see that 
you know, um, well, entropy uh, sort of uh, reigns here. There's people inside the internet also. I really love this picture. I will show it in the presentation because you can really tell, you can't really understand how it, the internet actually works, but I think you can get a sense of how much energy it actually needs to operate when you see like the actual infrastructure. Yeah. Um, well, I'm gonna skip this. So the internet runs on devices. Yeah? And uh, here I'm gonna also focus on all these uh, very uh, contradictory messages that we get from the IT giants and, and reality, because whereas they say that we run on 100% renewable energies, it is an impossibility because the internet is not just them and their infrastructures. Yeah, internet needs a lot of other infrastructures to operate. Uh, devices, for example, servers, and many other things. So this is a research that was published in December 2017, which for the first time it was stated that devices were the most polluting industry in the world, yeah, before even the meat industry, housing, transportation, coffee, and aviation. Yeah, and, and this is something that we cannot ignore because it is quite critical. And then you start to dig a little bit into this and, and okay, how can this be, you know? Why is it that way? Uh, in 2010, uh, iPhone disclosed the way their iPhones by then were produced, and they disclosed that they had more than 10,000 different parts that uh, came from 700 different territories and were assembled by 300 pairs of hands. So when we take a device, we are in front of something that is one of the most complex objects that we produce as a society. And on top of that, it has more than a third of all the elements that we know. So it's really, really, really sophisticated and very energy training uh, objects to produce. Yeah. For example, there is something, well, they use a lot of uh, something called rare earth elements, which is basically what allows to make technology uh, smaller, less heavy, and much more functional. Yeah. So, well, these are some of the of these minerals that are part of it. And I'm gonna go very fast. I generally give a 12, 13 hours workshop about this, but I'm gonna just spot like a very few things that I think that are important to look at. Then there is also all this world of resources. Um, I'm not sure, I guess some of you have um, known about this uh, geological US survey, US Geological Survey Agency. It's an American agency which its uh, main goal is to look for critical resources all over the world. Yeah, and then when, when you start to connect the dots, which is really not that hard, you understand, okay, so Afghanistan had the, one of the most, uh, one of the biggest uh, lithium deposits in the world. Yeah, and we all know what happened in 2001 and how the US like, uh, went into Afghanistan very fast. And most of us, we already forgot about this war because then we focused in Iraq straight away, right? But well, the deposits are there, I'm not sure what's, what's up there and what's happening there right now, but it's the same thing in Bolivia, yeah? This has the biggest deposits of lithium. Lithium, by the way, is one of the minerals that are most crucial for the batteries of our devices. Without lithium, we wouldn't have the uh, batteries that we have now, and therefore we wouldn't have all this mobile network society that we all talk about, yeah? Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of what happened in Bolivia. There was supposedly a coup d'etat last year, uh, but things are very, they're very hidden behind the smoke screen. And I think when this happens, there is something that is really happening there, much more than you know, we acknowledge. And, and well, I think it's really interesting to understand what's gonna happen there in the, right now in the next years because of this mineral. And this is uh, Bayanovo. This is the biggest uh, mine of rare earth minerals in the world. It had, uh, in 2014, at least 70% of the world reserves. This is a place that it's very hard to access. Uh, this picture was taken by um, a collective, a British collective called Unknown Fields. But they sneaked in somehow. They managed to get through the desert and take this picture. Uh, and this is one of the very few pictures that exist about this mine. So all these places, even though that geopolitically they are crucial to our society, are very hidden and nobody really knows what's happening there. And I'm not gonna start talking about trading of minerals because it's like a really black void. Nobody really understands what's going on there. Actually, as, as just a small note, Philips tried to disclose their supply chain. Uh, it took them more than two years and they couldn't find out everything. So if somebody with the amount of resources <laughs> like Philips cannot really understand 
all the supply chain of their products, we are completely done. I mean, we are just prone to disaster. That's where we are going. Uh, well, uh, I think that the Congo case has been uh, much more widely reported in the news. So also there is cobalt, which is also crucial to our devices. And there is a lot of slavery work, like uh, people displaced, and all kind of uh, very, very uh, horrible uh, things going on there. And then there is all the refining process of all these minerals, um, which is really, really radioactive. Uh, there is tons of radioactive waste derived from um, just cleaning up the minerals. Let's say to have like this raw material that it's going to go into our devices. This is a crazy picture. It's also from unknown fields. Um, this is the adjacent lake of uh, this refinery, which is very close to Bayanovo. And it's just a lake of radioactive, radioactive, uh, radioactive waste. <laughs> Sorry, it's a hard word to pronounce. This is a, actually it was an exhibition by Ars Electronica. I went into Berlin, and and this uh, collective just took a little bit of um, this radioactive waste that was uh, laying in that lake, and they built three bases. Um, one equal the big one, the amount of uh, waste. Uh, to build a battery, a car battery, the other one a laptop, and the other one a smartphone. I went through the exhibition, and the small one was something like that, probably. So they're actually quite big. Yeah? And this is just for one object. So then it's not just like the tangible devices uh, that waste a lot of energy during the production and, and operating phase. Right? But it's also data, because we tend to think about data as something that doesn't exist something that is just not there. And when I started to research all this, I think it was about 2013, which it's not really long ago. And, and even myself, I didn't understand that this was connected. And once you just wonder about it, you just realize, of course, this is not coming for free. This has to come from somewhere, right? Uh, so I was really, really worried that um, this equation wasn't really embedded in the social imagination. So I started to research a little bit, and I didn't find much papers that uh, had proper numbers. And even this is really important. I saw somebody taking pictures here. This is an estimation. This is a um, number I got from a paper in the University of Berkeley uh, that was published in 2008 that was trying to calculate the amount of uh, energy uh, waste of online advertising. So they came up with this number, but it was in a very precise network with very precise servers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what I also found out that it's really hard, or it's basically an impossibility to have like an exact number of emissions in the internet. Because the internet is probably the biggest infrastructure that we ever built, and yet it's really invisible. And it's highly, highly complex. And it's impossible to understand the impact of the ecosystems. And I think this is really problematic, right? Because the internet is very at the core of uh, economic development, social development, and you name it, right? It's really crucial to, to society as we are. And it's uncontrollable completely in terms of ecology and environmental impact. And this is um, also a really nice project that exemplifies this. There is not a lot of artists that have been working directly in the relationship between data and materiality, but uh, Michael Saab did it. He's a German artist. He, in 2009, he did this project. And this is the amount of coal needed to burn one million views of the trailer of Avatar in YouTube. Yeah? So the electricity needed to serve this video, this trailer, one million times, equal to all this amount of coal burned. And I think that you can relate to this much more than to numbers. And I think it's very important to keep all those things in mind. Yeah. And there is something that's even more worrying, because this is an estimation, but uh, through 3G and 4G networks, as a user, we used to do or generate 2 gigabytes a month. But with the implementation of 5G, this is going to grow until 30 gigabytes per month. And this is massive, and I'm really not sure how the Earth is going to respond to that. Yeah. Again, this is like the crazy amount of data that we're going to produce in the, in the following years. Like, uh, it would take more than five million years to watch the amount of video that will cross global IP networks every month this year. And there is something that yet, as I said, the internet is expansive, but we just communicate with it through interfaces. We really don't have access to the infrastructure and all these algorithmic workforce that work beyond the interface. Yeah? And this is a project by ShareLab 
that we, the only thing that we can see here is on the left side, it's the interface, and these all these algorithmic processes that basically organize and uh, deal with our data. Yeah, but this has a massive environmental impact, but we cannot see it, and we are not connected with it, therefore it doesn't exist, right? But it is there. Uh, this is a project I, I released last year, which I tried to calculate the amount of energy needed uh, to load or to effectuate a simple purchase of a book at an Amazon website. And I came up with uh, just 12 interfaces, but the amount of code which I printed, it was uh, almost 9,000 9, pages of written code. Yeah? So there is all this disparity about what we see and about what we don't see, yeah? which I think we need to, to have it very present for obvious reasons, as I already explained. And it's not just that, it's also all these infrastructures like the data centers, the massive data pantries that occupies vast amount of land. Yeah, like a typical data center can go up to, um, I can't pronounce this, 165,000 square meters, which is equivalent to 24 soccer pitches. Also, for example, Amazon, in terms of um, materiality, they have more than 100 million square meters yeah, all over the world just to operate. Um, their business, basically, and this is massive, yeah. And also there is, <laughs> it is brilliant because it's so stupid. So there is like these uh, engineers at Microsoft that they had a problem to solve, which basically it's how we're gonna cool down our servers in a very sustainable way. And somebody said, okay, why don't we put them underwater? And even the slogan was, well, 50% of the population of the world live on the shores. Why shouldn't our data do that as well? Well, <laughs> I'm not sure I need to answer this, but um, if you put a server that's very hot underwater, you're gonna obviously make the underwater very, very hot, right? But there's nothing about this in the page of the project whatsoever. Um, they have uh, these live webcams where they show like these mammals and fishes just uh, going very, or uh, cohabitating with the servers in a very peaceful and nice way. I'm serious, you can go, it's uh, in the internet, it's not the project, yeah, Microsoft. Uh, I'm gonna skip that because I guess I run out of time, Pao. <laughs> well, this is just, I, I need to mention this. So this is uh, Jeff Bezos um, opening like a renewable project for Amazon. Uh, and this is another advertising where uh, Amazon announced that uh, his, uh, that his, working with, uh, heavily with fossil fuel industry. Yeah, so it's like all this paradox that they are just intertwined together constantly. And this is not just about uh, Amazon, it's also about Microsoft, it's also about Google. They also partner up with very, very big fossil fuel companies. And at the same time, the, this is, um, Bill Gates was the founder of uh, this initiative, which uh, they promote uh, projects that work with renewable energies, but at the same time, well, they also are funding this, uh, Google uh, founded some of these think tanks um, that are kind of made change in years and so on. Uh, and then we cannot forget this. These are the, the engineers behind this amazing, fantastic undersea uh, server, underwater server. And this is the group. When we talk about techno-patriarchy, this explains it. Yeah, those are most of the guys that are designing, or the group, social group uh, context that are designing these technologies. Yeah, and it's basically men, they are white, they are in between 30s, 50s, 40s, I don't know, probably in between Catholic and Jewish, and they are mostly Anglo-Saxon. And we cannot take this out of sight, because this is really important. Yeah, so I'm going to leave it at that. Sorry, I uh, overextended a bit. <laughs> okay, th thanks. thanks a lot, Joanna, for your, your chat and your, your insights into this uh, urgent question right now. And uh, now no, we're going to move, move on to Ingrid Guardiola. In Guardiola, she is teacher, audiovisual programmer, director, and as she is, writer. Um, she director and writer. She has contributed from all these perspectives to public debate and television formats, formats and the role of images and technological devices in today's world. She was director no, of the Soy Camera a project, one uh, great project that um, uh, was uh, made of a laboratory for new visual formats produced by the CCCB, the Center Contemporary Culture Center of Barcelona. And uh, he is also director of the Barcelona Sample of Quality Television, Miniput.
No, no. Uh, not now. Not but now, <laughs> no, but she was director. Of, she was director of that. Uh, she has taught in several Catalan universities. Well, she uh, has also carried of research into questions related with gender inequality and technology in the framework of the uh, audiovisual culture and practice. No, she a uh, um, couple of years ago she published uh, uh, um, uh, the essay Lully la Navalla, the eye and the knife. <laughs> let's say it this way, uh, in which she analyzes the uh, whole images condition uh, over private life and uh, determine the dynamics uh, of the public sphere and communities. No? So I would like to ask you some questions because uh, you have been re recently thinking about uh, what you call the myth of the abundance, no? mm -hmm. as uh, Joanna was also explaining in some way all these numbers that she was showing us. No? Uh, in relation with the imaginary of disaster that yeah. we are living now. So please, please tell us a little bit about what is this myth of abundance that we are all living in. Okay, tell us, please. thank you very much, Pau. And Ingrid Guardiola doesn't speak very well English, so sorry for that. When I was a child, I didn't go to a summer camp, so uh, <laughs> I'm going to try to do my best and I, I'm going to read. Um, I'm going to read. So... And of course, I, I've, I've, uh, I've bring with me some, some images. We are going to see a lot of images. Well, not a lot, because there's only 15, 12 minutes. So we are, we are going to continue. I have structured uh, this brief talk uh, in three points. Uh, the, first, uh, the first is um, the myth of abund ab abundance in Hollywood films. The second one is how social networks is uh, just uh, being, picking up all these uh, imaginary and myths of abundance. And in the third place, uh, the new, new Prometheus and the patriarchal technotopism that uh, is it's very well reflected in the in the picture that Joanna has has shown. So let's let's start with uh, with Hollywood and also let's start with uh, capitalism. Um, as the anarchist anthropologist David Graeber, uh, who, who died last week, said, perhaps capitalism died in the 80s and now we are facing something else. Uh, in 2008, one academic paper uh, coined a new approach to capitalism, speaking of necrocapitalism. That means contemporary forms or, or, of organizational uh, accumulation that involve dispossession and the subjugation of life to the power of death. Um, David Harvey would call it accumulation by dispossession. Hollywood and private television uh, have been two essential tools to create the necessary myths based on exploitation and destructions. Uh, they, have, they have created uh, too much um, myths that we are uh, very used to this image. This, the, the, the image that, has, that, that Joanna has shown us, it seems like uh, the science fiction films that we, we see in every screen. So uh, in the 60s, uh, Susan Sontag said that being uh, a spectator of calamities uh, taking place in another country is the quintessential modern experience. Uh, so Sontag uh, it was just an announcing what nowadays it's just um, our daily bread. So now wars are also images and sounds at home. These are, these are our, our homes. Um, of course, images are the main tools or a very important tools of the, of the capitalist uh, project. Um, they are the new skin or the skin of the, of the new flesh, so we have to take them very seriously. Uh, so, um, uh, as Mark Fisher pointed out, uh, public space is abandoned, given over to uncollected garbage and stalking animals, neoliberals, the capitalist realists par excellence, have celebrated the destruction of public space. Capitalism is what is left when beliefs have collapsed at the level of ritual or symbolic elaboration, and all that is left is the consumer spectator trudging through the ruins and the relics. No? trudging through the ruins and the relics. Um, this turn from belief to aesthetics, from engagement to spectatorship, is held to be one of the virtues of capitalist realism. This is very important. In this way, science fiction films and catastrophe films immunize us against the evidence of the extinction of the world. They metabolize our anxiety through aesthetics. 
uh, after the, the 2008 global crisis, uh, Hollywood articulated this, this aesthetic narrative and emotional uh, um, stories. Images of the planetary collapse, uh, detroitism, ruined porn, uh, all these kind of images. Uh, films to delve into the Anthropocene, uh, um, but um, only as a fiction. So we have th here three, uh, three examples the, um, of, of the wall uh, just co um, collapsing. Here we have the inert mega cities of Blade Runner or Ghost in the Shell. We have the, uh, the bunk bunker wall of World War Z, Cosmopolis, light, Last Days on Earth, Passengers or Oblivion. The suburban miserable settlements of Elysium, District 9 or Ready Player One. A wall of climate refugees of uh, Interstellar, Mad Max, Snowpiercer, or The Road. These are just a, a very few examples of this last decade in Hollywood. The ruin is a dialectical image. It concentrates uh, what historically and, collective, and collectively has to be assured, but Hollywood has depoliticized the ruins. Hollywood movies do not ask themselves what to do with the waste af after the great consumption party and after the great theater of war, but how to do what is necessary to continue as we were and keep family, social, and economic structures intact. Post-produced ruins are just as beautiful as historical ruins. The landscape of devastation is a still a landscape, said Susan Sontag. Already in the 60s, uh, Sontag wrote that science fiction's film deal with catastrophe, one of the oldest themes in art, and, they, uh, and that they use the image, images of destruction as their main theme, and that they can be described as popular mythology for the contemporary negative imagination of the impersonal. And this impersonal can be the, the, the servers, no? this, this, or the, this uh, fictional uh, corporations, um, uh, included in this, in this kind of films, Ghost of the Shell again, Blade Runner, Elysium, Hunger Games. There is also an evil corporation uh, that is, uh, is going to explode the, 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 the planet Earth. No? And of course, they make us believe that the new government, made of experts, military, and a white male hero who sacrificed himself, will save the world to return to its original abundancy and peace. Hollywood has created the myth of a world that can reborn locally, only locally, from the ages, thanks to these un new unborn Prometheus like Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt, or Matthew McConaughey, nostalgic heroes whose memory of the happy home will serve them as a perpetuum mobile for guaranteeing the future of humanity. They are the new mad men who, unlike mad men, preach good hurt. But like mad men, all they want is to try to save their family in a post-civilizational wall. The main unto untold plot of these stories, the inner ritual, is how to go uh, beyond an unhealthy, limited, precarious, and restricted situation to a new situation, a resurrection of civilization based on the very traditional myth of abundance of natural and artificial resources. That means how to transform a disciplinary society organized around the, around the enclosed spaces of the factory, the school, the prison, the homes, and the ruins, into a controlled society in which, as Mark Fisher said, all institutions are embedded in a dispersed corporation under the figure of a debtor addict. We can say that the disciplinary societies use limits and restrictions, and the controlled societies play with the myth of abundance through smoothy structures like social networks. So uh, I'm going to... Um, take this uh, second part very short. Uh, it's because it's very clear that social networks, um, it's, uh, that Hollywood has found its best ally in platform capitalism, in social networks, but of course this abundance, it's only a pragmatic fantasy, a mirage. Um, and uh, a mirage that we can, that, that it's rooted in a very, in, in, uh, in some cultural tradition, uh, let's think about uh, Lewis Mumford when in the myth uh, uh, of the machine said that uh, the attraction that the immense supermarkets uh, that, that, that the immense supermarkets exert on the people may be due to the fact that they are the mechanized reproduction of primitive Eden. The, the, the primitive uh, paradise. Uh, he also argues that the primitive man was a great taxonomist and a great collector 
host's ability to describe and differentiate elements of the environment was due to uh, that capacity of, of collecting uh, things, not only, not only food, but uh, uh, a lot of kind of things. Uh, and that this accumulation uh, developed uh, his intelligence. So now we delegate this uh, collecting process to the machines, to the algorithms, so uh, we are living in a smart world and we are becoming uh, more dumb because we are delegating this collecting process to the, to the, to the machines. The, uh, these are spaces for the cornucopia, for the abundance. Uh, we collect a lot of friends, likes, shares, a lot of gratification. Uh, but uh, this is only an, an illusion. I have summarized uh, these five reasons why is, is, is this abundance is an illusion. Uh, so uh, it's first of all because the data-driven capitalism uh, collects information uh, uh, only to, to, to process this, this data. All you accumulate is all what, what you're going to lose. Uh, secondly, because these platforms are connected sites based on social metrics, algorithms, and computer protocols, uh, like in a Skinner box. Uh, third, um, due to its, to, to its algorithmic architecture, you see uh, in a leading position what is sponsored or successful. Uh, fourth, uh, the paradox of choice, uh, if you can, um, uh, described by Svars, that explained that in a framework with many alternatives and an environment of abundant choices, uh, this makes that human, uh, the, the human being uh, will be less satisfied with the decisions he makes. And finally, uh, the, the, the one that has explained very well, Joanna, the, the, the temporal and material boundaries of, of Internet. So these are not idins. But uh, they did also ha had his limitations, his walls, his uh, prophylactic zone. Um, but the wall couldn't protect paradise from the catastrophe. And now I'm, go uh, I'm gonna to, to pass to the third, uh, the third point. Uh, well, sorry, this is just Atanasius Kircher, the description of paradise. Um, and he uh, remembers us that uh, in the original version of Paradise, in the Persian version, uh, uh, walls were very necessary to describe Paradise, uh, to protect uh, the one, the, the people that live on Paradise from the violence of the wall. So social networks pro, uh, promise us that they will pro, uh, protect uh, from the violence of the wall uh, through the algorithmic care. We can say like that. Um, and the third uh, point is how this, uh, as, as social networks uh, can't uh, avoid the, 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 the exception of status and the extinction of the wall, so uh, Hollywood uh, has um, invented new myths, uh, new salvation myths. No? The pandemic uh, of the COVID has normalized the exception status uh, and the limits and protocols of isolated homes. The home has become a safety place, but it's far from being considered a paradise, an abundant place. It's the result of a disciplinary situation, a very stressed and problematic place. It's not it's home sweet home, but home bitter home because we are uh, closed. We are locked in this in these uh, houses. A lot of films remember us that we live in a very limited and sterile wall in front of what Ray Brasier calls the truth of extinction, like the road, interstellar, children of men, or the Handmaid's Tale. Uh, the wall they describe is a wall without homes where citizens are permanent refugees. Uh, the fourth picture is uh, of the Moira refugee camp that has burned this night, affecting 3,000 3, people. It's indistinguishable of the, of the other frames, of the other fictional uh, frames. Uh, so we are not surprised when we see these kind of pictures because our unconscious is, uh, is uh, overwhelmed with uh, other, other similar pictures. So uh, just to con uh, conclude, in front of this extinction situation, there has been two kind of reactions that uh, Rosie Braidotti synthesized very well. In one hand, we have the panic about the future of the human, uh, and on the other, the excitement about being able to become more than human, not this kind of, of, of um, um, answers to, the, to, this, to this situation. The first one is the nihilistic hedonism. The fetish is this above, well described by Mark Fisher, uh, that we can resume with, um, I try not to think about it, or we all knew it, but uh, still we kept doing the same, or um, it's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. And the second one, 
It's uh, the patriarchal technotopism described by Joanna that tries to invest in high tech like artificial intelligence or, art or artificial colonies outer space like Elon Musk uh, or the, pro uh, the Jeff Bezos project inspired also by science, by science fiction. Jeff Bezos uh, uh, wants to, con to, to build uh, these colonies through the O'Neill uh, cylinders uh, that, that, that are that are part of our, our science fictional films, no? In, yes, the, and I'm finishing. In, Interstellar or Elysium use this, uh, these uh, O'Neill um, cylinders described uh, by a physician uh, in the 70s, and he wants to, to put in practice. So, um, versus the apocalyptic, apocalyptic fetishism and, and all this new, new uh, Prometheus, um, uh, very well uh, accompanied by other other films like uh, these ones, uh, a very brave man um, trying to to conquest new 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 worlds uh, to find new lands of abundance. Uh, we have this very strange, also of course, Hollywood movie. So we are in the imaginary of, of Hollywood. As we are still in the in this imaginary. Uh, but I will oppose this patriarchal technotopism. Um, to this, uh, this proposal. In front of the Homo Destructor, we can find the Mulier Restituor. Uh, so uh, abundance was, uh, he, uh, the film told us that abundance uh, was not where you were looking at, in your past or in your future. It was in your renegotiated present. A very wise, a strong, empathetic, and freak woman uh, um, that prioritized community freedom to false abundance replaced the madmen with their sterile, irrational, and unfair ways of organizing the end of the world. When we read the poster that the future belongs to the mad, and this is the last, the last diapo, uh, uh, we should read it not in the traditional way and in the advertising well, be mad mm, by your product, but in this way, in the way that, uh, in the way pointed out by Ma Mark Fisher when he said that depressive uh, and, and all the, the massive mental, uh, all the people who have suffered massive mental damage under capitalism, the these robots, etc., etc., et that they will uh, protagonize uh, the next revolution, uh, revol revolutionary class. They really do have nothing to lose. So Brad Pitt, Tom Cruise, and Matthew McConaughey have too much to lose with their bourgeois memories and epic colonization, but most part of the people don't. So how should be our particular fury and careful road? We don't really know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, in, uh, Ingrid. Well, this relationship between home and catastrophes and uh, this myth of abundance and also this myth of, um, uh, of survival, no? uh, of defending against the, the, out, the, outer, uh, the outer world. It's really right now uh, things like we are living right now in this, in this, in this not just in Hollywood, but uh, in our real uh, normal life. No? So it really connects with, with what Joanna has just said, and also with w what uh, Andy is going to, to talk about, because there is this connection with this fetishism of the catastrophes that also you, you also connected. No? No? You are not going to use it. Okay, so thanks a lot. Andy Gracie is going to talk then. Um, uh, he's a British artist based in Barcelona. Uh, in his work, examines uh, the opportunities that other disciplines have, uh, offer to creative practice, such as biology, astronomy, or robotics. No? In his works, he uh, uses different media that come from installations where sound, video, etc., by art, conjugated as a language of its own. No? Uh, the whole of his work is situated between art and science, generating situations of interaction and exchange between emerging systems and behaviors. And his recent works, he examines the cultural impact of space research, as you were mentioning also, space research and the science of astrobiology that maybe he's going to talk about later. No? His work has been exhibited in many uh, places and also festivals and also has been awarded by some prizes, also as Electronica, honorary mention in 2007 and 2015, I guess. No? So, Please, Andy, we know you have been uh, recently dealing with the apocalypse and also, and also with the fetishism of catastrophes, no? something you've been working right now. No? And this is something you have been working lately and that connects with some of the current ongoing crisis. And, uh, so tell us, please, about this connection that you have been uh, working and how okay. do you deal with your 
at practice? Thanks, Paul. Uh, yeah, I am, I am going to talk about fetishism of disaster. I was just telling Ingrid that I didn't need the, the clicker thing. <laughs> I have this, um, this video, which I'll comment on later. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed your presentation, Ingrid, and I think some of the things I'm going to say will resonate with that from a different perspective. So uh, I had very little time to prepare this, so I'm really hoping this isn't going to be an example of a disaster and I can actually engage with different perspectives of disaster. But I'm going to start by telling you a, a, a short story, describe a thing that happened when I was, uh, when I was a kid. That I used to have, um, when I was a kid, from the ages of about five to nine years old, uh, I used to have a vision, and it wasn't, it wasn't a dream, it was, it was like a fever dream, it was, like it, it was a, a waking vision, it was this thing that would just appear and consume my very being for, for a few very kind of lucid moments, and it would come regularly and unannounced unexpectedly. And it was, the vision was these two massively heavy, massively enormous metal spheres uh, and they were joined together by a thread that was like a human hair, really fine thread, and they were really slowly trying to move apart. And if this thread were to break, it would unleash the most horrific catastrophes across the world and the universe. It would be the end of everything. And uh, recently it started coming back. <laughs> and it kind of feels like in many ways, it feels like this thread is as close to breaking as it, as it ever was. And so this the recurrence of me engaging and kind of trying to deal with this, this thing that haunts me is to develop a series of works which are called the Haunting Series, where these, um, the, the sensations which are generated by this vision inform a series of works which kind of deal with how we interiorize and deal with the notion of disaster, which is becoming more of a... Um, more of an ever-present in, in our lives, less and less of an abstract concept, and more and more of a, a something that we realize we may have to live with to some degree. Um, so my interests in this, in this series are about, it's kind of the aesthetics of disaster and how we prepare for disaster, and, and how they are bound up in a form of um, wishfulness or even kind of fetishism. And this extends into how we're interested uh, and how we engage with disaster as a kind of hyper-object, and how we accept it into our lives as a cultural and social phenomenon, and the ways which prepare for it, and even rehearse for it. Um, a kind of a local and global anxiety versus a politicized kind of denialism. Uh, in the background is um, there's a series of video stills of a project I'm developing now, and I'm developing now um, which are exploring the aesthetics of disaster and the concept of existential threat, which is called catastrophe jangled hideously out of process. Uh, where I'm training an artificial intelligence system, a machine learning system, to develop, generate its own kind of scenarios of disaster. The irony being the artificial, artificial intelligence itself is one of the many... Um, uh, uh, um, objects which is considered as an existential threat in its own right. I'm also developing a longer term project in residency with the Institute of Cosmic Sciences, the University of Barcelona, called The Ends of, Un the Ends of Everything, which is about the end of the universe itself. You know, we talk about these different apocalypses and our survival strategies, our preparatory strategies, where we have to assume that there are apocalypses coming from which there is no escape. There is a finality to everything. Um, in, you know, we have these kind of long-term unavoidable apocalypses, which we have to compare with the mid-term unavoidable, and then we have these near-term kind of maybe avoidable apocalypses. But the apocalypse, the ends of everything, the catastrophe, is embedded within the very fact, very, uh, fact of our existence. So but a, a crucially important caveat to these things that we're talking about, I think, is that we have to bear in mind that for the majority of us in our privileged positions in a protected part of the developed world, this is something new. This kind of rising intensity and urgency of the climate crisis combined with a rise in bizarre right-wing popularity politics, combined with the collapse of the notion of truth, combined with a pandemic which we fear may only be the first of many, is exposing many of us for the first time to an uncertainty and precariousness 
which has been the norm for a great many of the inhabitants of the world. Um, which is one of the things that allows us to, to engage with this, this, great, this great phase um, of nihilistic hedonism, which you mentioned, which I think encapsulates so many great ideas about this. So that we find aesthetic delight in natural disasters is kind of puzzling. Why do we sometimes delight in natural disasters? And is it morally appropriate to do so? How do we express that aesthetic delight? So in this really brief introduction, which I've done half of already without even starting, I'm going to mention two of the forms that how we do that, and it might shed light on the attraction. One is through culture, the visual art, cinema, literature, and so on, and the other is through a thing called pre-enactment. And maybe we'll see that the drives and outcomes of these engagements could actually be quite hard to separate, which hints at something much deeper. So it goes without saying that disaster is a spectacle, and the global purveyors of information know that. The news and Im images from disasters feed the contemporary catastrophe awareness on a daily basis. The competitive need for attention forces media to distort, break down, and pull apart disaster scenarios in order to provoke the sensational. In typical cases of event journalism, their job is to, me being to make way too much out of a little something. An integral part of our current visual and verbal language does consist of risk messages, health and safety risk assessments, hazard tapes, warning signals, business plans with risky outcomes, fire drills, unexpected diseases challenging the health of entire continents, plant and animal species, and even entire archipelagos at risk of disappearance. This barrage of catastrophe, fear, and anxiety can produce the psychological phenomenon known as a collapse of compassion and compassion fatigue. A loss of emotional connection with disaster can perversely and paradoxically coincide with the desire to see more of the same. Kant was among the first ones to highlight that disasters provide both aesthetic pleasure and displeasure, depending on whether we have some safe distance from the natural disaster or not. In the first case, we experience the awe-inspiring version, while in the second case, we truly realize that we are physically powerless in the face of disaster. He made the connections between these emotions and the sublime, that which is at once beautiful and terrifying. Dacia Keltner and Jonathan Hyde in 2003, in a 2003 study, began to expand on this approach to war as a perceived vastness and a need for accommodation. They defined the feeling of awe in the face of high projects such as disaster as an inability to assimilate and experience into current mental structures. They concluded that awe can produce an informed related state such as admiration, elevation, and the epiphanic experience. The representations of disaster in culture have been varied, from blocks that bluster such as 2012, Armageddon and, Armageddon and San Andreas, and a thousand zombie movies where the strong, invulnerable hero comes to do battle on behalf of good and against evil, the Prometheus that Ingrid was, was talking about. Again and again, one detects the hunger for a good war, which poses no moral problems and admits of no moral qualifications. One of the main themes is this United Nations fantasy, a fantasy of united warfare. A great enough disaster cancels all enmities and calls upon the utmost concentration of Earth resources. We also see examples where despair is not allayed and the hero is powerless or just absent, such as the terminally depressing but compulsive 1980s nuclear war film Threads. In the visual arts, we can compare old masterly paintings of the erupting Vesuvius the aftermath of citywide infernos and the wrecking of ships, where the awe of nature and the accident is palpable, to more complex recent treatments, such as maybe Simon Faithfull's reenactment for a future scenario 2012, where we see the adrenaline-charged rehearsals of an airport fire, fire crew rehearsing on these kind of uh, mock up aeroplane fires, where the adrenaline fades into tedium once the disaster is averted. And then there's the Japanese Okin Collective's Operation for Something Black and Hot, also from 2012, which was a training film made in the aftermath of the Fukushima, the Fukushima tsunami. Meanwhile, we have another postmodern theatre which grows out of an increasing awareness of the inevitability of crisis and disaster, a phenomenon that Francesca Laura Cavallo calls pre-enactment, a form of identity, identifying the way Supposedly forthcoming dangers are performed before they happen. She points out how dram dramatized instances relate to performance, reenactment and simulation, and underline how their structure is very, very similar to that of theater. In these scenarios and those of other cultural manifestations of disaster, 
we are empirically experiencing without despair the fact that there are forces we cannot control. Examples of pre enactments can include school shooting drills, evacuation procedures, rehearsed earthquake and tsunami protection protocols, all disasters that we expect to come. The photographer Nina Berman wrote that simulation drills are like state-sponsored performance art, where realism is replaced by theatre. There's actually an increase in this state-sponsored large-scale disaster theatre. From the World Bank's September 2017 pandemic simulation held during their annual meeting in Washington, this is not the kind of event that people would typically associate with the World Bank, but it's one of the many exercises the bank has helped to organise, reflecting what experts say is the growing awareness outside of the traditional global health sector of the increasing threat and economic disruption posed by a global pandemic. The B612 Foundation is, according to their own website, an organisation that works towards protecting the Earth from asteroid impacts and informing and forwarding worldwide decision-making on planetary defence issues. The B612 provides a non-governmental voice on the risks, options and implications of asteroid data while advancing the technical means by which that data is acquired. They also organise a regular large-scale theatrical performances of how to react and to and survive an asteroid impact with the Earth. Meanwhile, the Future of Humanity Institute at the University of Oxford, led by existential threat guru Nick Bolstrom and the Centre for Study of Existential Risk at the University of Cambridge, are working on what they term the pre-paradigm environment. In other words, a cultural and socio-political preparation for that coming change in paradigm. I think that much of the fascination and fetishism of consuming images of disaster comes from two perspectives. One is that, as Susan Sontag so astutely observed, we are rarely inside anyone else's feelings. It's all external. Another is the seduction of seeing the normal turned upside down, the normal made weird, the known landscapes and signifiers being turned into something shockingly new, the ability to fantasize about how we would explore and survive this new reality. It's the new anti-mundane. As we Europeans, or ex-Europeans, and being another crisis, move inexorably towards joining the developed world, Hurricane Ali and wildfire country in regularly tasting disaster. We can probably find out quite soon what will change for disaster enthusiasts and fetishists and for disaster artists that are exploring this paradigm. Okay. Yes. I'm done. Okay, per <laughs> perfect, perfect. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you very much. Of, of course, your, your talk, uh, uh, your ideas were highly connected with both of the talks. I mean, mm. this is great. And I'm sure it will be connected with uh, what Israel is going to, mm. to talk about because <coughs> I, um, sometimes I, I, I'll tell him he's a disaster uh, specialist, let's say, <laughs> let's say, disaster man. Sometimes I call him disaster man because right now this is one of the, your areas of, of specialization. Yes. Uh, Israel is, is uh, um, and thank you for your talk, um, Andy. Israel is uh, currently full professor, full research uh, professor at the IN3, the Internet, Internet, Inter, Internet Interdisciplinary Institute <laughs> of the Open University of Catalonia. That is easy. <laughs> And his field of research is the so-called STS, the Science Technology Studies. Uh, so he's a social scientist, let's say. And the study of new forms of technical uh, democracy, social experimentation, public debate and mobilization, as al and also particularly interested in understanding the role of technoscience in new health and social care activism and in public engagement and participation in disaster situations. So you're going to talk from this perspective that in some way is highly connected with, with all that we have been dealing in this talk, no? this political ecology of disasters. No? Uh, he is the co coordinator of the CareNet Research Group and has been visiting research at uh, many uh, universities as the Longborg, Longborg University, the Center for the Study of Invention and Social Process of Goldmeets College London, our Instituto de Sociología Pontific Pontificia de la Universidad Católica de Chile. In 2014, he received the, uh, the Amsterdam Award for the European Association for the Study of Science and Technology for the book, for the book, uh, disasters and politics, politics, materials, experiments, and preparedness that you co-edited with with uh, Manuel Tironi and Michael Guggenheim. So, um, Israel, <laughs> from your perspective uh, as a social scientist, 
uh, and a specialist uh, in the study of disasters, have you have just, we have just seen. Uh, could you share with, with us uh, some of the things that you have learned about disasters through your uh, your life of studying this uh, this particular uh, events? Sure. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Paul, for this uh, long introduction. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to answer your question, I'm going to take you to Puchuncaví. Puchuncaví is a small uh, town, 150 kilometers uh, from Santiago de Chile. It's the home of the largest copper smelting plant and other 14 petrochemical complexes. For the, fa for the past five decades, Neighbors of Puchuncavi have lived with uh, excessive levels of toxic chemicals, arsenic, PTEX, different types of sulfurs. The cloud, as neighbors call it, envelops their daily life. Harmful, harmful in industrial chemicals, sediment in their lungs and on the bodies of, of their loved ones, on their water wells, animal companions, and plants, as Pedro is showing us in this picture. The harm is so severe and ubiquitous that suffering has become a normalized feature of daily life. Not a spectacular disruption lived in the excitement of the eventful, but a chronic, silent, and creeping condition that is inseparable from everyday life. Once a quiet location, Puchuncavi has become a sacrifice zone, as they call it, a permanently impaired, impoverished, and isolated community in the name of progress and national economic development. Over the last years, mainly together with my colleague and friend Manuel Tironi, my research has revolved around how citizens and communities like this cope with and resist to slower forms of disaster. The expression slow disaster is not new. Building upon Nixon's idea of slow violence, the historian Scott Knowles uses the expression to frame disasters not as a specific terrifying events demanding immediate response, but rather as long processes of environmental degradation and deferred maintenance on technological systems. Actually, as anthropology scheme Fortune puts forward, in our time, we can see slow and fast disasters side by side. We see an increasing incidence of acute disasters, think of Fukushima or Katrina, but also of chronic and slow disasters, as it happens with the slower crisis related to the effects of radiation, waste, or pollution. But to me, the notion of slow disaster is not just a way to broaden the range of disasters to study. As I will argue, it's mainly a way of intervening, conceptually and politically, to the very notion of disaster. It is, above all, a way of opening up and problematizing a notion, that of disaster, which often falls, falls short at naming processes, scales, and temporalities that define many contemporary risks, hazards, and violences. I will go back to Puchuncavi to unfold this argument a bit more. How did these communities strive to cope with systematic toxicity? After spending time with neighbors, attending meetings, and discussing with activists, we witnessed that care, practices of care, were a crucial element in the daily struggles of neighbors trying to cope with industrial harm in Puchuncavi. A couple of brief examples. Firstly, we attended several meetings of former workers of the smelting plant. While these meetings were arranged to discuss legal actions against the plant, they were in practice a therape therapeutic attempt at making bearable um, the afflictions faced by, by these poison ex-workers. A space to talk and share experiences, anxieties, and anecdotes. A moment of healing, self-care, and support. Actually, it was through the exchange of stories and testimonies that the green men, as they are called, reinforced their emotional ties, affinities, and identifications with each other, shaping a resilient and caring collective subject. 
The second form of care emerged in forms of domestic and intimate care. Cleaning, repairing, mending, sheltering, healing, with which people, mostly women, coped with chronic harm by taking care of their companions, husbands, gardens, grandchildren, people in Puchunkabi open up space for knowledge production and political speculation. The attention paid to the minute alterations affecting their loved ones, the dedication granted at healing sick people, sick relatives, help to reconstruct the trajectory of harm. As they acknowledge, the practice of care helped to join the dots. It rendered visible and palpable the suffering that expert analysis often conceal. Through care, they made connections, identified actors, and established a larger vision, vision about causes, consequences, and liabilities. We learn from Puchuncabinos that care was extremely important to engage with lower forms of violence and harm, both as spaces of healing, awareness and resistance, but also as an epistemic tool to make visible undervalued voices, lives, geographies. Or to put it differently, by engaging with many of, this, of these communities, we learn how important it was to question what counts as a disaster, when, how and for whom a disaster happens. Indeed, we learn that the usual image of disasters as natural, unexpected, acute, and strident events can be a clear obstacle in terms of representation and political strategy to understand, mobilize, and act decisively in front of certain forms of harm, abandonment, or violence that occur gradually and out of sight, that are dispersed across time and space, and that frequently are hardly viewed as disasters at all. So from my work, I've learned that the very definition of disaster is extremely political. And this is one of the points I'd like to make. Not only because there is no easy agreement on what is or what is not a disaster, but because the grammar of disaster is also a way of distributing the sensible. It's a way of making certain things visible and hiding others. That's why I find slow disasters inter interesting to think about our present. They help us challenge our focus on disasters, slowing down our analysis, reasoning, and science, making room for critical takes about the framing of contemporary, pressing, and difficult to change situations, considering also other forms of expertise, representation, and even of democracy. Indeed, slow disasters help us pay a greater attentiveness to questions of visibility and invisibility and boys or voiceless, um, looking not only at the cute moments, at the loudest voices, but also at more chronic and silent issues of social inequality, exclusion, abandonment, neglect. Slow disasters thus as disruptive as they require a complete rethinking of the ethics, politics, and science of disasters. But would it, what would it mean in this context to rethink, for instance, the new climate regime, sometimes framed as an emergency, as a slow disaster, or this pandemic? What does it mean to slow down a big fire, a hurricane, or a heat wave? What other vo voices can we hear? What processes of degradation, violence, or abandonment become visible? What forms of governance? of resistance, of healing, or repair are now possible. Again, what counts, what counts as a disaster? When, how, and for whom a disaster happens? Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> okay thanks. thanks a lot. <clears throat> thanks a lot, Israel. The, 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 last, the last things that you were saying, what counts for a disaster? This is one of the key questions here. And it also connects with uh, the how to deal with disasters and and the importance of this care as something that you have been studying. No? So, uh, in some way, uh, we have been dealing with with many um, many different uh, questions regarding the, the relation between uh, the internet materiality and the 
and ecology, how, the, of, how uh, these two things, apparently not connected, are highly connected, and we need to be aware of that. Uh, then we moved uh, to talk about the, the Hollywood imaginaries and, the, and the, this um, uh, myth of abundance that is behind that, that it's not just in Hollywood, but it's in our lives, and we, we live through that, as we, have, we, we, ju we just saw the previous presentation of Joanna. And also then we moved to this, um, this is connections with um, with um, with Andy Grace and this this fetishism of the catastrophe with all these images that you were uh, you were uh, constructing from this artificial intelligence um, uh, uh, machine that uh, were generated through through that. No, so it was uh, also um, um, uh, a way of experience these catastrophes and the the, 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 the the thought that are behind that. No, so the, the different connections are uh, the different uh, talks have been dealing with this uh, this. Uh, these uh, different ways of of, of uh, getting together uh, this political ecology of disasters, no, F through art and science projects, uh, but also through um, uh, re reflections from the most theoretical part or from the sci social scientists. No, so this has uh, mm, uh, has a clear connection not with with the current situation, uh, we, we don't, uh, and that's why uh, and, uh, the next uh, roundtable done going to to uh, to moderate to conduct will be about uncertainty that is something that is behind that behind all this uh, way of dealing with this with this um, disaster no? so you may have uh, some questions between within all of you you may have uh, some some uh, commentaries about these different notions of disasters some different notions of of the the concepts that are behind uh, all those different practices or maybe we could uh, lead uh, the, uh, to some questions from the uh, audience, if it's okay to you. Um, so we will have uh, enough time to, to, to get a couple of, some two or three more questions. We have uh, enough time. Uh, we, we are we're supposed to finish at uh, 1925, uh, so we've got like more than uh, almost 10, uh, 15 minutes to, to answer the questions that some of you may have. If there is any question in the room right now, there are some questions in the YouTube channel also, I think. But first, I would like to, to see if someone here is, has uh, some questions, the ones that are heroic, ones that are uh, here <laughs> uh, when outside is raining and <laughs> uh, yeah. So maybe we could move on to some of the questions from the YouTube ch channel. Hey. Hi. You remember? Hi. Yeah. Hi, Leopold Zika asks, okay. hi, how does, how does a positive feminist utopia look like? <laughs> <laughs> a, a posit, uh, how does a positive feminist utopia like? OK. Does anyone? I, I can only say that it probably looks much better than a positive masculine utopia. <laughs> but apart from that, I'm not sure I'm the most qualified to answer that question. I don't know. Okay. Yes? There are some connections between Ingrid, you mentioned uh, Bray Dottie's uh, uh, thought that in some ways deals with this. Uh, um, some of the ideas, will you? Yes, I, I like the, the, the Mark Fisher considerations of the um, um, subordinate or invisible people or, uh, or the ones that uh, are never taken in consideration. Uh, so between them, we can consider also women. Not now, perhaps, but in, in history of humanity, uh, women were not taken in consideration, not in the Greek Agora, for example, no? mm -hmm. to put a very clear uh, example. I'll, I don't like to talk about utopias because I'm, I'm very happy between ruins and problems and disasters. So as I am not a so so solutionist, I believe in what Reko Horvat called like an, an optimism without hope, uh, something like that. Uh, so. Um, 
and positive, I don't, I, I believe also in, in the positive effects of negative discourse, so <laughs> perhaps I'm not the best person to, to, to answer this, this question, but I, I can, I can, well, I know what he was waiting for, but I'm not the but right person. But, <laughs> no, but, but that's a question, that's an answer, because yes. the, there are some traps hidden between, between the words, let's say, and what comes after these words and the thoughts that are behind the idea of the utopia or the idea of the positive, yes. let's say. I think that technotopism uh, is also um, uh, building uh, uh, its discourse against something. So mm -hmm. uh, he needs to destroy to build his discourse. So this is a very um, phenomenologic negative uh, uh, this have a, a very phenomenology negative consequences. So um, when I see this kind of uh, white male entrepreneurs, uh, I see them as as um, like as a, as, a, as a fighters, as a, as a destroyers. So uh, they try to be positive to show his positive uh, uh, futures hopes, but. Um, um, the 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 answer it's it's on the contrary uh, of of, uh, of what they are pr uh, projecting. Um, of course, the 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 feminist perspective on technology it's it's uh, a very new form uh, the perspective. Judy Wachman on the 80s hmm. was reflecting very much uh, how to how to invert uh, this this um, close relation between the genre and technology. So I'm I'm just studying. This, this this relation. Uh, of course, we need more uh, feminist uh, perspective on on the on the design uh, of technologies. Of course, for it's, sure, it's evident. And and I think that from a, a feminist point of view, um, the the answer is not uh, sending uh, um, uh, exploring the outer space like in the ancient westerns. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Well, that's that's an, that's, an, that's an answer, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah for we sure. Renegotiate the present. Yeah. Yeah, we have to renegotiate the present. For sure, <laughs> for sure. Well, th this is the, this idea of the techno utopia is something that you have been also dealing uh, is Israel in, in the science technology studies. This is something that is uh, one of the the um, uh, horses of uh, to, to where one of the main uh, problems of, 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 of things that are dealing with. Uh, in some way, no? The well, I think that the question about uh, the, how feminism or other critical stances could intervene in these concepts, I, I'm, I agree that I'm not uh, that interested in the idea of utopia, but I'm interested in challenging the idea of disaster. And in, in our field, feminism is very important as a source to try to, to challenge that. And that's why I also s were, was interested in talking about care and trying to understand how these concepts and, and perspectives and sensibilities transform the very idea of disaster, and particularly the masculine view, the male view of, 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 of this co the concepts surrounding the definition of disaster, like risk, hazard, or mm -hmm. the kind of response that we do uh, in front of these uh, situations and the role that care plays or vulnerability plays for sure. um, in understanding problems of security, for instance. Mm -hmm. So I think that I don't know how it would be, but I, I am sure that it would be very different and other concepts would play a, a, role, a more central role than the ones that we are used to, to grasp uh, to think about this, these topics. So, and I think it's very much needed, of course. Yeah, for sure. We need to get out from these common grounds and common common words that sometimes don't let us think about um, far further than, than that. I think there are some more questions over I there. Like, We've got 10 minutes? Yeah, so we've got some more questions. And just as a response to that idea, I think it, it, it kind of plugs in somehow. I was just kind of looking at the title of the talk. We're talking about an ecology of, of disasters, and I'm wondering how, how we can consider what an ecology of disasters is. And kind of looking kind of historically that there's, the history of humanity is a history of disasters, from collapses of first civilizations through internal means or external influences or from natural disasters. We look at kind of collapses of populations in, uh, in Polynesia. We look at the, the collapse of the Native American um, civilizations through external influence, invasion, the Australian Aborigines, etc., etc. Uh, the people who were buried in Pompeii, this series of like, you know, disaster has affected human history. So 
in some ways is like this, you know, do we consider that disaster is the default state? And that, you know, I, I was talking about disaster on this big spectacular scale, you know, that this is something that is coming, but the fact that we are all kind of living disaster in various degrees and that there is maybe an interdependence, a cause and effect of these disasters, which we could term an, an ecology. And that, I mean, I'm no expert in this, but I would put some kind of money <laughs> betting that the vast majority of this ecology of disaster, this kind of default state of disaster of humanity, is kind of male-driven, <laughs> right? You know, so thinking about the Unmilitaristic, if hmm? you may. Unmilitaristic. Yeah. It's not only male, it's a particular uh, version of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, precisely, precisely. Mm. So, so, yeah, I mean... Yeah, that was a, a, a kind of a reflection, those points to mm. maybe feed into the and conversation. And yeah. is Israel uh, asked the question, uh, w what we can consider a disaster? This is a very key yeah, exactly. question because uh, we are in the middle of a pandemic and, and this protocol is a disaster. So this, uh, this, this social distance, this quietness, this uh, um, pressure of the, of the limitation of every aspect of life, it's a disaster. It's not, uh, we, we have not used to this uh, visual rhetoric of the disaster, but it's a disaster, of course. Yeah, uh, I think we have a couple of questions more. Uh, yes, uh, another um, <laughs> question. Yeah, there is another question. Uh, Pierre Boudin asks: Could technology save us from the disaster, <laughs> or is it that the contrary? How art can help with that? How can what? Who can art, art help? Art How can help. art help with that? <coughs> well, I can answer this. No, there's no <laughs> way. There's no way it can do this. Um, no way. <laughs> there's no way. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, no. It just well. We can start for what I discuss here, right? Like technological development. It just increasingly uses more natural resources, and uh, the more technological development we have, the more uh, natural resources it's going to happen. Even like the renewables, it's a, it's a huge, huge paradox, because to just build the technology um, that will be able to generate renewables at large needs a lot of, a lot of natural resources, which in turn are going to run in old fossil fuel industries. So it's just like one layer after one layer after one layer, and I think, layer, sorry, and I think that's like this very, Again, uh, techno patriarchy, utopia in the future. Like, let's fix things, you know, in one in top, and this and that. You know, instead of really looking at a holistic uh, way of how things are related and um, how things really work, actually, and just not try to fix things, but what I think it's said, just negotiate with the present and with the things that we have now, and uh, not try to implement just like another layer of things. Um, mm. and to complement yeah. this, the other day I saw the Neuralink's presentation of this this kind of um, device, the Elon Musk device, just to put on the brain, and and he talked about that. Uh, um, in face of uh, uh, electronic problems, electronic solutions. Uh, but <laughs> depression, anxiety are not electronic problems, are not are, are, are problems. Uh, we have to understand the context uh, of these problems. So uh, this is this kind of uh, thinking. And yeah. I, I also think there is like a critical thing, which all these solutions tend to be very reductionist and tend to uh, obfuscate complexity. And without understanding and apprehending and embracing complexity, there is nothing that we can even start negotiating, let alone fix it, which I think is a really bad word. But, uh, mm. Yeah, I, I, I agree completely with what you're both saying. I think they, uh, this, the idea of kind of the technological fix, the technological ut utopianism, is probably one of the most dangerous concepts mm. that we have right now, this kind of false security that... It's okay, technology will save us. If it's not Jeff Bezos or it's not Elon Musk, it's the next generation that there will come, that humans will develop the savior technology. The, assuming, that, assuming that the way things change has some kind of permanence or at least some slow state, that things will remain the same long enough to find the fix that works that situation. Everything's so changing over the time scales that it's kind of ridiculous to think that there's a, a thing. You know, I mean, for example, extrapolating the thing right out, which I like to do about kind of deep futures. In just over two billion years, the Earth will be 
uninhabitable for any form of life. <laughs> and in about several hundred million years, if humans last that long, it won't be inhabitable for human life. So where's the technological fix for that? We can maybe kind of avert small disasters or, or um, give some kind of palliative care during disasters using technology. But unless we kind of... The long-distance space travel is not going to happen. Moving the planet Earth is not going to happen. Building a shield against the sun is not going to happen. So, you know, we kind of have to accept it, really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Technology is never going to save us. Not now or not in the future. Mm. And to reverse, uh, Judy Wachman talked about um, uh, that this kind of uh, uh, of techie people uh, thought first the technical solutions and then ask the social problems because we we should uh, make it on the uh, on the contrary, you know, yeah. for, to ask first one the social problems and then uh, to find some kind of um, precarious answer in um, um, supported on technology and of course on human relations and knowledge and. Okay. Perfect. No, yeah, for sure. Uh, maybe you might uh, want to add something about that? Uh, well, yeah, Israel? I think that one of the problems with the, the narrative of the technological fix is precisely the notion of technology. So mm -hmm. it's on, one thing that we should also open up and try to problematize in the way that we normally assume in that question, if technology will save us, that technology is something very particular outside mm -hmm. us and also a very particular kind of technology, mm -hmm. very spectacular. And, and, and in the field of disasters, for instance, Many of these expectations come from big data or, or other like big interventions, technological interventions with massive money and lots of infrastructure to try to solve a problem. But they, I think that we also have learned that technology is a very much uh, everyday life kind of relationship and it's part of society. We are part of that. I mean, it's, it's a seamless web. It's very difficult to distinguish uh, how we build society without technology. So in that sense, probably we have to reframe the question and try to understand to what extent technology is part of, the, of our life, of our solutions, part of our problems, of, of course. But I think we have to, yeah, to reframe a little bit the, the question and the role of technology and what we mean by technology. That would help. OK. So that would make a great end because we are right now on time. It's uh, 19.25 right now. So I guess that we need to, to finish, we need, no? So thanks a lot for all of you being, for being here. Thanks a lot for all your interventions. And thanks to all of the, you that you have made it to, uh, available to, to come to here to, to this design hub. And also those that are there in the uh, live streaming uh, looking at us. So thanks a lot. And let's move to the next uh, session. Thank you. <laughs>